right. We are on and What's going on? I see Linda is here, sort of. Is she here? Like, look down. Look at that. There's like a face. Yeah, but there's no picture. I don't Linda, hear I can't hear you or see you. I'm not how, do sure know, exactly. how do you know it's her? Uh, Look at just put it your, says it. Yeah, it says it, right. Well, um, Ooh, I know it's sure looking for very entertaining viewing. Yeah, I'm uh, sure it is. Uh -huh. Well, let, let's start discussing a little bit, and then uh, I, hopefully Linda can officially enter somehow. I hope so. Um, I'm sure she'll find her way on. Yeah, Linda, we're rooting for you. We're going to be discussing liars. Well, uh, well, you can. <laughs> or how do you want to do this? By the way, do you want to just like randomly discuss, or do you want to just go essay by essay? There's only four, so I suppose we can yeah. go essay by essay. Although there's this time there's not as much as as much that I want to say, but yeah, there is a few really really powerful moments in this match of essays too. Yeah, we can start Definitely. with liars. Let's start with Liars, which the essay on lying starts with a huge discussion of memory. Yeah, he's really, he likes doing this, right? He's like, he discusses a kind of tangential topic and then moves on to his what he really wants to say a little bit later in the essay, or in some cases right at the end. Yeah. <laughs> it's really <laughs> interesting style. I'm, I'm like, when is lying coming up? And then it does. <laughs> After a quite a long discussion of memory, yeah, but there's there's a, there's a connection. There is a connection yeah. between lying and memory. He's going to make the connection, but I was surprised that it didn't start talking about that. Anyway, um, I like the discussion yeah. about memory, though. Me too. I like how he kind of defends his his poor memory. Oh, and there was Linda. Um, a little bit. He says, like, it's not all that bad. It's not all that bad. There's there's kind of benefits to not having a good memory. Yeah, I kind of wrote down the benefits here. Like, uh, you don't have to follow. You don't you don't follow others' judgments because you can't remember them. Yeah. Um, you're not overburdened with details. Yeah. Uh, you don't remember injuries against you. Yep. Yeah. And you really can't lie. Oh. Or it's difficult to lie. Oh, look at that. And finally, there she is. Yeah, you made it. Oh, and you are muted. Unmute yourself. Yes. You start muted, yeah. Can you find the unmute button? Maybe it's I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Hey. Ah, yay. Hey, long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, long time no see. Long time no see. I'm really close, aren't I? I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you were in the middle of a sentence. And... <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We were just starting the uh, Montaigne essay on uh, liars. Oh. Um, yes. Did you uh, did you have a chance to look through uh, the liars essay? No, I saw that you were going to read it and I just noticed that I was here and had time so I thought I'll jump in. <laughs> jump in, all right, great. Yeah. Awesome. Rare Welcome back. Come together. <laughs> <laughs> Can tell us about your lying experiences. My yeah. lying experiences. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, but we're on air, right? <laughs> um, but that's a, but that's a, we'll we'll uh, we we'll see we'll see uh, where where you can fit that in. But first, yeah, we have to talk about memory. Talk about memory. Yeah. Wait, let's talk oh. about memory first before we talk about uh, liars, because this, this essay starts with a huge section about memory. Um, and he kind of def he has a pair of very poor memory, and he defends in a weird way. He says it's a vice, but it's a vice that saves him from other vices. Yeah. Which, yeah, Dustin, you talked about. Um, so four of the benefits. There's one more. I was yeah. gonna say I can't remember. But I like I like um, that you ambition. Right? He... That's right, ambition. Um. It sounds interesting um, that it's a vice that saves you from other vices. Yeah. He says, well, I mean, he says, like, things like, you know, you can, he will more easily, he'll forget injuries against him so we can more easily forgive others. Yeah. Um, he can reread, I love it, the more, most hilarious one, I think, is he said he can uh, reread really good books yeah. and, like, he's reading them for the first time and really enjoy them again. 
He says he has that advantage over people with a good memory. <laughs> Sometimes I really do wish I could see movies for the first time again. I mean, throw, throw yeah. away all my preconceptions and see it again fresh for the first time. Um, some things, some experiences you want to do fresh the first time again and again. Mm. I, I kind of like at that point, but right at that point he kind of says, like, I have a bad memory, but my friends kind of are doing me a disservice. He says uh, his friends accuse him of kind of almost purposely forgetting, like their their like meetings. Like, oh, I can't believe I can't believe you forgot, you know, like meeting me on that day, or I can't believe you forgot to, you know, buy so and so a present or whatever. And he's like, he kind of says, like, look, you know, why you why are you on my back here? Um, I just have a bad memory. Like, it's not like I'm trying to forget what's going on here. Which is kind of which is kind of hilarious, but I don't know. I kind of feel like it, it, that excuse has never worked for me in my entire life. <laughs> I, I've said the same thing to so many people, including my wife, and uh, especially with her, it doesn't work. <laughs> it, that's interesting, isn't it? Like, I guess I wonder if you could apply it to another situation where. You promise to do. You promise to go somewhere, but the car wasn't available or broke down, or therefore you didn't go and you didn't. I guess you've got to con. You could contact someone then, though, couldn't you? How can mm. you shift it so that it's not just a like? Would you get away with it in another in another context by saying that the vehicle that allowed that arrangement to occur broke down through lack of memory, therefore I have no responsibility for that. That that I'd believe a lot better than his excuse, which also I do this excuse too, it never works. Like if my car broke down because I forgot to maintain it and then I was late, I can actually forgive that, but I guess what people say to me when I say like, whoops, I forgot and I have a bad memory, they just say to me very bluntly, you have a good memory, but you only remember what you think is important. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite harsh. Yeah, and I'm like, well, you got me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do remember things that are really important to me, and the rest is kind of, I let it fly in the background. And I don't know what to say against that other than, yeah, you got me. <laughs> yeah, I do remember things that I like. But now you've got a perfect excuse for next time. I forgot to maintain my car. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if, if I wasn't his friend, I would say the same. How about like a, uh, wiping a computer database and losing the record? Mm -hmm. uh, Would we? Uh, ooh. You were going to submit something, but you didn't because the computer base was wiped. Like, so long as you've got a memory, you can always. Let, you, know, it's a, you can't really mm. substitute anything for this, can you? Yeah, I don't know. Like, some of my students try that with me, and I'm kind of like, well, sorry, man, the assignment was due today. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'll see what I can do, but you're still getting a penalty. Uh, <laughs> so, I guess, yeah. So I guess everyone's applying the same argument to memory as to every. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I, I guess it's interesting that later on Nietzsche and the yes. psychologist will come in and they'll say something almost exactly the opposite. I mean, he'll say something to praise Montaigne. He'll say that being forgetful can actually be the greatest virtue ever. Because it allows you to act in the world, like you'll say this, that you're not overburdened with facts, mm. and not not remembering everything and not having to think about everything allows him to do things in the world, and that actually forgetting is an active feature of the mind, and that that sometimes just letting facts pile up in your mind is a way of kind of creating a a yeah. disjointed psyche. Mm. Don't you think it's this is because I want to bring this, especially Nietzsche's point in here too, because Montaigne actually kind of, in a weird way, makes this point, you can read this out of this essay where he says, um, 
he finds that people who have a good memory often have poor judgment. Yeah. I thought that was a really interesting observation. Um, and I, th- I mean, just thinking about why, why would, well, assuming that's true, why, you know, like, why might it be true, right? Because, like, if you relied on your memory uh, all the time, you, you probably wouldn't rely on your gut judgments as much. So this is a, I, I thought of this kind of a weird example. This might be a terrible example, by the way. So I'm just going to throw this out here and feel free to criticize. Um, imagine driving, trying to use your memory like trying to remember what you were taught rather than your judgment. I think you'd be a terrible driver. Right? But people who have excellent he's trying he tries he wants to say I think people who have an excellent memory try to rely on their memory but that screws up their like moment to moment judgment because it's it's not quick enough to, you know, make the decision when it's needed. I, I think he is also suggesting that when you read books, you kind of, and by mem- remembering the judgments of great thinkers, you're kind of letting them think for you. Yeah. Whereas he no longer can do that, so he has to rely on his own judgment. So he's less built up as just faculty for judging things on his own, with, with his own mind, as opposed to just simply remembering the judgments of others. Would you? Would you? What would you say about this? Uh, I tried to look a little this up online a little bit, but would you say? indecisive people, would you say a lot of people who are very negative are indecisive or pessimistic? Do pessim- does pessimism and indecisiveness, is that, are those related at all? I mean, apparently people with clinical depression actually have memory defects, but this is clinical depression. Like, they, they have vague memories. They can't remember. I, I want to take clinical depression out of the discussion. And, like, for example, just imagining someone who's indecisive I just occur, like as I am sometimes, like what happens to me is I'm kind of like, well, I could do that, or I could do that, and oh yeah, I just remembered I got I I could also do that or that, and then that might happen. Um, it seems like the more I keep applying my mind to it, the the more difficult it becomes to make the decision. Uh, I think that's linked to intelligence <laughs> mm. rather than pessimism or anything like. Yeah, mm, like memory. To, think, to be mm. able to quickly move through a number of choices and see the possibilities, maybe to think further, mm. maybe. <laughs> mm. I don't know. Pessimistic people. Are. I wonder whether they build the, they base a pessimism on a, on. Um, oops, I've lost it. <laughs> really? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but you're um, linking pessimism and indecisiveness, but not linked to memory. Well, I'm going to kind of link it into memory via pessimistic people having lots, being almost crushed under their memories of bad events. I was wondering, I was just thinking that. I was trying to kind of work this whole thing together if I could, but I'm not sure if indecisiveness and, and pessimism or or being negative are all that linked either? I think I'm indecisive, but I don't think I'm pessimistic. Mm. I think I'm optimistic. Mm. But but because there are so many wonderful possibilities and there's Mm. so little time. (laughs) What would you say about this then? I kind of like this. Maybe because I I find myself indecisive a lot too. Would you say, what would you say about this? If, if if you could say this about me too, but if I said like um, the fact that I see so many possibilities but I can't choose between them shows uh, I have a lack of judgment or there's deficit in my judgment, like I can't like because judgment is the ability to sort out what's important and what's not, or, you know, like what should I be doing now? What comes first? What comes second? But like in my mind, I got this list of possibilities, and here I'm staring at them, and I'm like, I don't know, well, what do I, what should I do first? I don't know, which one do I even want? I'm not sure. Would, would you say, I mean, that's a lack of judgment, right? That's a deficit of judgment? I'd agree with that. Mm. Maybe it's a lack of application of judgment. Mm. Like, a lack of, you don't desire it. <laughs> mm. I mean, it could be an indication of the strength of your desire, too. I mean, if, if you don't have a strong desire, then I could easily sway you. Like, I used to do this all the time, remember, when we were young. I'd say, yes. 
Like, yes. do you want to do this? Well, we, but we could do this, and then maybe if we did this, we could have time for this later. But if we did this, maybe we would have to do it later, and then we'd have time to do something else later. But maybe the other way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would just go back and forth for about 15 minutes to see you suffer under my yes. contemplation. And then by the end of it, you were just like, it, you realized that thinking about it wasn't going to solve the problem, and you often told me that. Um, <laughs> but it was almost like a game to see which way I could push it and then push it back the other way. But I wonder if that was just the... I mean, but when it came to things that I really, really cared about, I don't think I played that game so much. I wonder. Mm. Wow, brothers, are, that's interesting, because you're twins, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd often play this game, and then I guess it kind of showed me that some things you just can't decide. I mean, like, for example, if Mr. Spock were alive, I mean, like we, always, we said during Wittgenstein, right? I mean, if Mr. Spock were alive, you couldn't decide things purely on logic, right? I mean, I could offer you as many different scenarios. And I could offer you a million scenarios, but in the end, you just have to choose one. And the ability to shut out all the other possibilities and choose one thing, but Nietzsche called that the will to stupidity, but it's also a will mm -hmm. to action, right? The ability to act in the world is dependent on you being able to shut off and, and, and not choose, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it has, also, it, it's got to be in this, maybe. I mean, you can think through the possibilities. I mean, I think thinking through them could, should help you decide which one to which one to make, which decision to make, right? The, the more in detail you think about it, should in theory be helping you yeah. judge which one is the most important one. Mm -hmm. But I often meet situations where the more I think about it, the less attractive either one sounds, like over the other, and then I'm lost, right? But I guess in theory, I, I should be getting more information that should more be prompting true. me to action. But it, it doesn't happen very often, actually. <laughs> I guess that, that must stem from like a lack of realizing what's important and what's exactly. not. Exactly. It's a lack of judgment, right? It's a lack of judgment on my part, right? In this situation, right? Maybe I just don't have an eye. I, don't, I, can't, I can't see what's important right now. I can't see what I should be doing right now. Yeah. Maybe even maybe it's really even so gray that I don't know. Maybe what 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 is what should I be doing right now? I don't know. I you know a lot some of it just depends on me too. Maybe I, maybe I don't even know what I want. Again, probably a lack of judgment on my part about myself. Maybe not judgment. I I never know what I think, mm. I suspect people make artificial decisions and then they just stick to them. <laughs> mm. I, don't, I don't think that's good though. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really good. What, what mm. I do is I, what I, I wait and I, I trust my gut. I wait. Mm. It takes time though and um, you can think of all the stuff you want, but I don't, logic never leads me to a decision, not, mm. not based on, not really. And um, it's that waking, the time when I wake up in the morning, that time where I'm still close to being in a sleeping state. Uh, then yeah, that's it, the time. It, it hits you. Uh. Yeah, and I've been doing more meditation recently. Um, uh, and I'm, actually, I'm actually trying out this sort of like twice a day bombastic program of um, meditating myself to lose weight. It's like a mind control program. <laughs> oh. huh. That's interesting. Right, that, if that works, please tell me. <laughs> I need it too. Oh, I think it might. I suspect it might. Oh. It's wow. interesting. I find a, I feel a lack of desire for foods I would previously just choose without thought. It's very mm. interesting. It's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, wow, I'm so gullible. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, I can really use this for, for myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Against myself, no. <laughs> but, um, mm. wow. yeah. I know. I wonder if you can, in a weird way, take this back to existentialism and Sartre too. Like that, 
you not wanting to make a choice is a way of you running away from the responsibility mm. of choosing how and what you should be doing in your life, right? Not wanting yeah. to accept it, or a fear of a fear of missing out on everything. Maybe, it, maybe, it, maybe a thought that, like when I when I tempt you with all the possibilities, you think, well, I should be doing that, and I should be doing that too, and you think that uh, maybe it's a, a, a naive belief that you can be everything and you can you can have everything, and then I'm tempting you with 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 both choices and. You mm. naively believing that you can have everything in life when you have to realize that you have to take responsibility. You have to sacrifice. Yeah. You have to sacrifice, and you're not wanting to take that, make that responsible mm. choice. I I think so. I mean, I I kind of want to throw that in there a little bit. I kind of, yeah. I mean, this for example, like when you this often happens to me too. Like I just sit and, and I I sleep on it. It seems it seems to me though like. It, for some decisions, though, um, yeah. mm, like for what I want for dinner, I could <laughs> just wait on it, and I can just like feel it out. You know what I mean? Like pasta or pizza, pasta or pizza, pasta or pizza. Uh, I don't know. Okay, I, f I feel like pizza. Carbohydrates. Oh, pizza. Yeah, carbohydrates. Some more carbohydrates. Uh, uh, but, like, should I be a carpenter or should I be a plumber? You, you can't feel that out. You know what I mean? Like, the, what, the revelation you have in the morning, but the revelation you have in the morning is a thought. Maybe it's got to have a reason behind it. It's not like, it's not going to boil down to, I feel like being a plumber. No. Or maybe the plumber... Often it, often it boils down to what I don't feel like. Uh, when you actually get the opportunity and you don't choose to pick it up. That's mm. I guess. Mm. I thought I wanted it, but oh no, actually I don't. You know, mm. or maybe, mm. and maybe looking back at the actions that you habitually take that show mm. not what your head thinks who you are, but what. Um, The things that you habitually wanted, you drift towards, maybe. Yeah, like you mean like self-reflection, right? No like, activities. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, reflecting on your activities, though, right? Oh so, yes, yes. Like, oh, yes. Reflecting on what what you've done so far, right? Like trying to figure out who who you are as a person. Yeah. Yeah. I I I guess in my case, I've got society's idea that okay, you've done a doctorate in art. Why did you go immediately into teaching? Mm. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, isn't the people who can't do it teach? You know, there are all this, there's all this stuff about you're very black and white about mm. you know what's successful and what's not, and and um, but if I look back at my life, because I'm, I'm getting older, there's a bit of it, you know, so. Um, start to piece together that, oh, wow, I really have to throw out those ideas of, you know, well, I did art, I have to be an artist, and it has to be one type of artist, or, you know, um, and start to try to have different self-talk about what um, creating a role for me rather than just taking one off the rack. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I do think that the morning is one of the times when you're most clear about everything. Um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and I think that's also because um, in, by the time your afternoon or evening rolls around, you're, you're thinking more analytically and with your, with it fully consciously. But in the morning is the time when your mind has had time to... Let's just let's just say a arrange its files at night, and and kind of your unconscious comes to life, and it dreams, and you make connections that you didn't realize you had made yourself, right? And when you wake up in the morning, you're you're left with new arrangements of what's going on in your life, and new perceptions on your life um, that you didn't have before. Morning is some of the clearest. That's when you can work your best, and when you have your clearest thoughts is in the morning, and that's because you're probably working more with unconscious connections and with conscious connections at that time than any other time. 
So mm-hmm. I really think morning is a, is a is a very good time to start making these 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 decisions. I agree with that a lot. Mm-hmm. I had a I um had an interesting experience recently. Um, like I've always known that I get my best artwork ideas in that half waking state, um, and that actually slowing down and just you know giving myself some problem, asking a question and then leaving it and then waiting for the answer to come works for me. Yes. Um, but, um, and recently I've been doing a bit more meditation, like maybe since mid last year, and um, at the moment I'm trying this weight control stuff. <laughs> um, mm. But, um, but, it's interesting just having that practice, and I, um, I just use you know different audio files of you know famous people, you know Deepak Chopra, or you know at the moment I've got this thing on my iPhone and I listen to stuff fairly randomly. Um, I'm not actually you know striving in any great way with it, but I am. I'm very interested in the way it connects me to my body and to my state of being in a quite simple way. Um, mm. But um, not, uh, two weeks ago I woke up with three keywords in my mind um, and I knew, I could see it was an artwork, an art project. And after making a few notes I went back to sleep. My, after I, I sort of went, oh no, I don't quite have it yet. By 9 a.m. I had a whole three-pronged project to do, you know, with university students, my artwork involving an art museum and me, yeah, but I think I got it to that point. And I'd, I'd never been able to do that much before. Mm. Um, and I suspect the meditation is helping me. And mm, I found that interesting. Yeah. I'd say meditation is definitely... One one way. There's many ways, but one way to generate. Way, yeah, yeah. To generate new ideas. Walking a lot because you know all this stillness. We're much too still as our English teachers. Mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, I hadn't really explored meditation or exercise much before. I just like used to sit in one. You know, like used to be a sort of quite tense. I used to think a lot. <laughs> I used to get very tired. Mm-hmm. Um, and then eat because it would give me more brain food. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. You know, it's, the mind's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I I I don't know. Like, how how do you come up with new ideas? Is something that I like. I don't have any firm theory on, but I like reading lots of books about it. And um, a lot of the times, your mind will do things with when you're not. They're making it do it right when you're not fully in charge. Like you, you think about a problem and you just put it in the back of your mind, mm. and then let your mind work on it for a while, and then yeah. come back to the problem, and you'll see it in a whole new light. Yes, um, it works much better than constantly frustrating yourself over the problem again and again and again. Mm. You, 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 first, you have to engage the problem. You have to yes. engage you it. You have think to about identify it. there is a problem. Yeah, identify well, the problem. Something to they, if you don't form the question, then often. There's no answer. <laughs> and, and then you have to let your mind have free play with it. And mm. then and then sometimes you, you think you see an answer, but that's not the way it should be done at all. And your mind will play with these ideas, I don't know how or why, and then either in the morning or during meditation or just before you go to sleep or even during dreams, the answer will pop into your mind, and there it is. And why that is, I'm not quite sure. But that seems to be the accepted, one of the, one of the testimonials of many great thinkers speak mm. to this, that this is how they get new ideas or how they think about problems. Um, yeah. And the other, the other, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about this, but pianists and writers tend to sit in front of their instrument of choice, don't they? And they form mm. this habit of just being there so that they're actually going to be there if, the, if an idea comes. Mm. Uh, creating the space, some sort of habit. I mm. never really done that, apart from you know liking to lie around and sort of be half awake. <laughs> but, um, I don't yeah. know about either of you two, but I find uh, 
I think with my hand sometimes. Your hand? I really do. Yes. I When I have a pen in my hand and I'm moving it across the page, um, thoughts come to me oh. much more so than when, when my hand is not moving and I'm just staring at the page. If I just start writing, things start flowing into me like crazy. Wow. In a sense, I think with my hand, right? I, like like the musician in front of the instrument, right? Like I just start moving my hand across the page and start writing something, and more and more stuff just comes out after that again and again and again and again. Um, I found anyway. That so it works for me in in, in writing. I think yeah. people who draw also may do that. I suspect uh, I'm not. That's not quite me. Um, which you know is. Uh, Another little hang-up I've got, <laughs> being in the fine art world. <laughs> like, woo, you don't draw very much. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's kind of, there's some, the, some interior art culture wars going on here. <laughs> yeah. There is, in my head, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it got into my head, oh, no. <laughs> Get it out. <laughs> I mean, the, the same thing you said about writing is, of course, the same thing we do when we speak, right? I don't yeah. think you've fully formed any of your thoughts when you start speaking. I mean, you have a general idea of what you want my one to say, but it's when you start speaking that the ideas seem to come out. I don't know from where, like Robin Solomon said, I don't know from where, but yeah. they seem to appear, right? It's really interesting that somehow you're doing it as you're moving along. Mm, um, that is interesting. Um, yeah, the mind is quite mysterious to me, um, where, where these ideas come out of, right? And sometimes you just have to do the action, be in the action of doing it, and you'll see things that you didn't see before, right? And I kind of I kind of wonder too, like maybe it also kind of I'm almost scared, like, you know, I, I like to think that I'm always when I'm alone I'm like thinking, but maybe the truth is when I'm alone I'm not thinking at all. Right? And when I'm actually thinking is when I'm writing or speaking. Yeah. Right? I mean and then when I'm alone and I'm like I'm looking contemplative, right? I'm actually there's nothing in my mind at all. <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> right? And then finally desk, I start desk wall beer. Desk wall beer, right? And then finally Unless when I start writing or speaking <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I'm afraid of that. I'm, it's not always true, but I, sometimes it is for me a lot. A great oh, deal yeah. is the, the thinking. The act of thinking is strangely associated to me with speech sometimes or writing. Um, and when Wittgenstein kind of suggested, I think he suggested in, tra in the philosophical investigations that thinking is internalized speech, right? Or if, if, if that's what he was suggesting, it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Maybe my mind is more blank than I. I'd like to admit sometimes. Mm. I don't know. Or at least consciously, yeah. Con Consci yeah consciously, consciously, consciously. Blank. Consciously yeah. thinking, yeah. Um, wow, mean, like, that was an interesting diversion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but in, you know what? Actually, now that we've got done talking about memory, I really don't have anything to say about lying, though. About Do you lying? Have any about lying itself, I really don't have anything to say. I mean, he says like his memory prevents him from being a liar because he can't remember what he's going to lie about, so he can't even start get started. Right? That's one of the things having a poor memory saves him from being a liar. Mm -hmm. um, but which is kind of humorous. But I don't I don't have anything to say about liars. It's just interesting he, that he feels like lying is the one thing that we should fight constantly uh, because lying becomes a habit, and mm -hmm. it's it's the most difficult vice to eradicate. But I thought was really, I don't know why, I mean, it's obvious, but I, I thought was really awesome here was that, you know, although there may be only one truth of a matter, per se, uh, even though that this... might have, there, there's a, a thousand falsehoods, right, that the opposite, uh, that you, can't uh, yeah. you can't just take a lie and turn it into the opposite, and that'll be the truth, because there's a thousand different lies you can tell, right, there's infinite lies you can tell, so the opposite of false, if you put a minus sign next to false, that or negating false, it might not be the truth per se. It could just be another lie. I kind of like that. It was an interesting thought. It does produce an interesting image in your mind of like the truth is surrounded by lies on all sides, like the light of truth is surrounded by lies on all sides. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know to if I want to go all the way that I in some cases the truth is, is one. I yeah, don't. I agree with that. Like I, I think that often... People's perceptions of one situation is so different than their idea of the real, like reality. Is truth, if truth and reality are the same, maybe, <laughs> then I don't think you can just have one truth because I don't think there's just one reality. But. 
yeah, I, I mean, he, he kind of says this, a similar thing in his in one of his other essays, where he's like, well, I'll write an essay and I'll catch like a glimpse of something, or I'll yeah. just kind of touch on the subject, right? And I'll catch a, a part of the truth of a subject and then write about that. In that sense, it, it, only in that sense, I like what he's saying here about mm. kind of this, this this vision of well, at the very least, you can say like the opposite of a lie, or at least the, the negation of a lie is not necessarily the truth. It's a lot. Yeah. It's, it's a lesson you learn in logic too, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> not, not not false does not equal true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in a sense, like if yeah. I mean, if I said like it's orange and it was actually like turquoise, right? And then you changed orange to yellow, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I suppose in formal logic sense, yeah. yeah. But anyway, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. In that, in that sense. Say that that if you said it was orange and then you changed that to not orange. Then that was actually one type of truth. Yeah, it would be true. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you were to say it's not orange, it, that would be true. Yeah. Mm. Um, but that's yeah. But in in the sense that you're talking about, Dustin, like I mean, if, if I just change to something like something else, if I just right. change it like orange, to, I don't know, red. If I change black to white, if I say it's not black, it's white. Uh, well, maybe it's you know purple, right? Yeah. In that sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you know the the king the king had an illegitimate child, and and then you know, I could I could change that to the opposite of you know the king what, the king had no illegitimate children, well that could be false too, and the 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 truth could be the king had five illegitimate children. Yeah. Um, the, the opposite just because you're you, you think you're opposing the lie with what you think the opposite is doesn't mean that it's hit on the truth at all, right? Mm. It's a much more denser kind of. There's many different possibilities. Much more possibilities than one would initially think. I just like that part in here. But that's maybe, about, oh. maybe that's the the key to being a good liar is using that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Like you just hit on a really good strategy of um, bypassing the core of the truth by telling other truths. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Have you could yeah. yeah sandwich your lie between two truths. That's a very effective way to do it too. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. And so let's move on to the next one. It's a that it is folly to measure truth and error by our own capacity. I don't, do you have a lot to say about this one? I have only I... one sentence to say. Here's my sentence. Ready? It's going to be one sentence. This is my All summary right. of the entire right. thing, which I did like this essay. By the way. Me too. I did like it, but this is my summary. Um, don't be foolish and be convinced by any of any argument that you're offered, but recognize your own ignorance and don't dismiss things out of hand. The reason why you dismiss argument or the reason why you think it's, dismiss things is incredible is because you're only only because you're familiar with things. So in other words, he's saying keep an open mind, right? But don't be a fool. That's yeah. the that's that's the subject. That's this essay, which is a great essay. Yeah. Especially the thing about how he says, well. This for this line, it is the novelty rather than the yes. greatness of things that prompts us to inquire into their causes. Um, right. right. I mean, because when you actually, when you with a fresh, open mind, when you realize all the fantastic things that are in the world and the fantastic things we believe that are true, right? You, you realize, yeah, there are really fantastic, crazy things, right? And you just can't mm. dismiss something out of hand just because you think it's crazy, right? Or when he talks about the doctrines of the church, mm. he's like, well, yeah, I thought they were just insane ramblings, but there was some thought behind them, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this this is what movie critics have to learn when they're like, "Oh, I saw that 2001, and that sucks. I didn't yeah. know what was going on. Boring, exactly. or like, yeah. no country for old men. Boring." This is where I want to take this. Like, I think this is a little bit of an attack on people who despise things they don't understand. Yeah. Um, in in, in the most happiest light, anyway. Uh, it was kind of like, yeah, well, if you don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not true. But some people fall into that. Yeah. Um, I did like the thing at the end to you about uh, pride. He kind of he kind of threw down the gauntlet about the church doctrine, though. He kind of said like, I, I thought it was kind of funny. He said like, look, um, either you accept all of the church doctrine because it's all being thrown at you on authority, or you throw it out. Yeah. Uh, and, and go on your own. Uh, I mean, I, I like that. It's very, there's a lot of clarity there. I mean, if if church doctrine is based in authority, mind you. I mean, I mean, he's talking about a church that's getting its messages from God, 
and and people who are you know getting their messages from God, like and they're handing them down to you, right? Who are you, lowly soul, to be using your reason to say, well, God could have never said that, right? I mean, at that point, right? I mean, reve revelation is out of the picture, right? I mean, that you're you're questioning these very guys who are saying they got revelation, so kind of the this use of reason destroys this. Uh, Authority, authority-based church doctrine. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, know, you 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 hit all the things I want to say. That's what all I got for that one. That's all I got to. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know. Hmm. Um, the next one too on books. Again, I enjoy it on books. I know. I don't have anything uh, to say. I mean, like other than like the. He mentioned the Dunning-Kruger effect really 500 years ago. You know, like, people who are ignorant over-assess their ability and people who are really smart yeah. uh, under-assess their own ability. Or people who are skilled under-assess their own ability. Um, but other than that, I mean, it was, it, was, it was fun to read and see what he was getting out of all these books. And, like, a lot of stuff was mentioned earlier about, like, brevity and don't weigh your books down and... Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like I, I want to get what I want to get out of my books, and I don't want to have to delve too long into them. It was really fun reading, but I really have nothing interesting to say. It, about the, most, this, do you? the most important line of this is uh, when he talked about how boring some books are to him. He said, "For me, who only wants to become wiser, not more learned or more eloquent? Um, I should like him to begin with his conclusion." Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good. And then, in a way, I kind of want to throw this back at him sometimes. Yeah, but, exactly. <laughs> um, a good essay or a good report or a good speech should start with the conclusion. It should say, "This is what I think. This is why I think it," and then finish with, "This is why. This is yet. This is the truth. This is what I think." Again, that's yeah. that's a good speech wrapped up, right? Yeah, it's wrapped between its thesis. Yeah, um, and. I thank God he said it here, the man who created essays. Right? He actually said it right here, please start with your conclusion. Um, even though he doesn't do that sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like, this is my favorite line in the whole essays. Yeah, please everyone, start with your conclusions. And I want to say that to a lot of Japanese uh, speakers. Yes, that's, that's not how it works here in Japan. It's no, you don't bad. start with your conclusion. You do not. Mm. Yeah, unless they've gotten this course in like Western pre presentation uh, making. Mm. Usually the conclusion comes at the end, and the whole time you're sitting there thinking, "What is this guy getting at? Yeah, is what is he getting at? Oh, that's what it was about." Yeah, it like snakes around. You don't know yeah. where it's going, and then finally you hit an end. But then when you look back at the whole thing, you're like, "Well, that was irrelevant, and that was irrelevant yeah. too. Why do you even talk about that?" And yeah. you're kind of wondering the whole time, "Did did he know where he was going when he was writing this speech?" I know. I know. I mean, it's a style we're not used to. I mean, yeah. it's a style the Japanese are used to, but it's to me, it's aggravating. And, yeah. you know, my students do it a lot, and I hear it a lot. I'm, uh, I don't know. It's, it seems sometimes it seems people who are terrible at it, their own vices appear in it constantly. Like, they, they, they meander. They don't stick on topic. Their points aren't well-reasoned. I mean, because they're, they're terrible at presenting, uh, even in the Japanese style, right? You know what I mean? So, yeah, it seems prone to a lot of vices, possible vices, if you do it wrong. So, yeah, I would like to... Jap in Japan, I would like that to become more common. Yes, yeah, start with your... I mean, like, for example, that guy on YouTube, that Kazuya or whatever, I mean, his, his YouTube videos are about two minutes, and he basically says exactly what he thinks in the first minute, and that's it. Yeah. Good. Please, more people like him up here. Um, he's quick to yeah. the point and funny. Exactly what you want from a, from a speaker. Um, mm -hmm. So there is light out there. There is hope and there's life. But, wow, I just read an essay this morning, and I had no idea what the hell was going on in there. Um, even when I read the end, I was like, what, what, is, what is this? What is this? I didn't even know. Was it in English? No, like, it was in Japanese. No. So it wasn't a language problem. Like no, no, no. They weren't struggling with expression. No. no. I've been no. listening to a lot of art students talk about their creative process, but they, it's interesting that they they tend to 
start off with the beginning point, just like you said. And maybe, I guess if you're trying to follow an intuitive sort of train, and that process is actually quite useful if you're actually trying to unearth some sort of process and it's an ongoing process so that you can help the person pinpoint because creation, maybe art making is more intuitive and it's not like a logical essay. Some, some, some students do approach it that way and some don't and it's very interesting to see the difference. Um, um, and often you can see the process in their words, like they'll start off with a photograph or they, a scene they liked and then they did a sketch and then they linked it with another scene and then they uh, did a video. <laughs> you know, it's mm. fascinating. It's fascinating. I mean... I, I guess that would be totally annoying. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm I, I, as much as I like stream of consciousness, you you can even do that within the form of an essay. But if you don't tell your listeners what you're up to, I mean, what I want, what I really want, that what I tell them to do is assume that everyone is the stupidest person they can possibly imagine, and they don't know what to listen for in your speech. And if they don't know, they're gonna fall asleep immediately. So tell them what they should be listening for so they know what to ignore and what not to ignore. Right? Okay. If you don't tell them and you're just listing random facts here and there and they don't know how to link them together, they're mm -hmm. going to be left with, huh? And they're going to fall asleep half in between or just be shocked by the ending and be like, okay. Right? Um, stream of consciousness could even work that you could say like, okay, I think this. But then you can even start, well, look, I, I thought about it like this, but that didn't work out. Then I came to realize that this and this and this and that's how I ended up here, and that's why I know it's here. And then, therefore, you restate your thesis again. But I don't know. I guess maybe when I want a speech, I want a kind of wrapped-up thought. I want a thought that's been kind of pondered on and wrapped up and, and presented to me with a nice ribbon, not one that just kind of fell, puked out on the paper as they were thinking it. I'm like, that's your first draft. You can puke it out on the paper, and, <laughs> oh, look, look at this is how your, your, your vomit progressed, right, until it finally reached the thought. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Now, give me the beginning. Give me the very end of that, and tell me how this all wraps together. Put it in a nice bow, trim it down, get rid of the excess crap, and, and present it to me with a nice, pretty pink ribbon on it. And then we got a, we, then we got a real speech. Um, until then, it's just you rambling, right? And that's, I mean, of course, I don't think like I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't have all my conclusions ready in my head, and that's the reason why I think we have these like little sessions is that. Sometimes it helps me to work out my thoughts and, and bang them against other people and hear them criticized and, and, and thrown back at me, and that's good. And in that form can work good for this kind of atmosphere, but a speech that's supposed to be finished, they, yeah. <laughs> um, I, want, I want a little bit more from a speech. Yeah, and those students, those students I'm talking about are not making speeches. Yeah. Uh, okay. But it's... They are talking about their artwork in an in a informal situation, and it's so. I think there's a guy who writes, who's written a book on art critiques and just how many different approaches there are to them, and how there is no way. <laughs> so, uh, and I think maybe the artwork on the wall is actually the speech. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. There we go. That's good. Package yeah. and expression. The speech would be the end product of a, a process of creation that led to that package that you present to people. So the package is already on the wall, but sometimes yeah. the package is not so good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. especially when it's visual art, you need it mm. in order. If it's not communicating, just like you said, often speeches don't. Then that's when we backtrack onto the the process of that led to that package. No, then it's important to know that. Yeah. The maker and uh, improved package. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, whereas, so the words are secondary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of like the maybe sitting with an essay with a student going, "Well, you did okay here, but what what did you mean here?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the, yeah, then, then the process of thought can become important, right? There, of course, there are instances yeah. where you did like, why did you, or what led you to this point? Yes. I mean, that's perfectly, yeah, that's a perfectly acceptable question. Um, e even in an essay, I mean, even in a speech, I would allow that, granted that it was presented to me in a wrapped up 
package, right? And not in a sloppy, I'm going to show you exactly, like George Bush used to govern, right? Uh, <laughs> he learned as he governed. Well, that wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough because he destroyed an entire country in your process of learning what the hell was going on in the world, right? Too late. Um, we don't need a guy up there that's just learning to figure these things out. We need a guy that's got his own thoughts ready and prepackaged and, and, and a theory ready to go. Mm -hmm. I, I just think yeah. it, it's, it's better for the listeners to have... I just assume that everyone listening is the stupidest person ever. And uh, they need everything prepackaged and ready to go, and they need to... The first line in any speech should be an attention grabber. It should be something like, you know, sex. What? <laughs> sex? <laughs> now I'm going to talk about sewing. Right? <laughs> now that I've got your attention, sewing. Right? It, that's what every... The first line should always be incredible. Like, you know, it's crazy. And then grab your attention, state the thesis, thesis, thesis and then move into your points. State, restate the thesis. Finish. Mm -hmm. And if you can, put humor in. Perfect speech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Maybe I should force my students to put in, like, some kind of, like, shocking sentence in the first sentence. Like, oh, I'm going to blow up the train station. Just Whoa! kidding. <laughs> let, me tell, <laughs> let me tell you about my favorite, you know, type of tent racket. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Are, you, are you guys listening to lots of presentations at the moment? End of semester. We 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 finished it. Well, those finished yeah a couple like, like a couple weeks ago. But yes, I was I was tortured by many students who were were like I don't know I I couldn't see what he was getting at until the very end. I was like, huh? That's what this was all about? <laughs> no, no, that's not. This does half the stuff didn't apply to what you were talking about. Uh, okay. C. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a couple of years ago, we had a speech here that opened up with, um, this is the first line, boys are scum. That is an opening line. Bam! Okay, wow. You, everybody in that room wanted to hear what was next. Not one person. A speaker, a guy? It was a girl. A girl. girl. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Everybody in that room wants to know. Of course, she didn't end with that. <laughs> that would be inappropriate to end with that. Of course, you know, we're not going to end with, yes, and I think boys are scum, right? No, no, no. It's, just, it's going to be a learning process, and this is going to be something you learn from. But that's the heavy, smacking, interesting opening. That that first line has got to grab you, especially in the Internet era. I mean, we're doing videos here on the Internet now, if anyone's listening, which no one is, that are an hour long. This is just not the appropriate format anymore. Um, videos should be about five minutes max 10 minutes on YouTube, um, good videos, maybe three or four minutes. And that's all the attention people have anymore. They have about a three or four minute attention span, and that's all, the only video they're going to click on YouTube. It's got to grab you. It's got to be an attention getter. Um, and that, this is the kind of skill that people have to learn to survive in the Internet era. There's just too many choices. If they see an hour video or someone that doesn't get to the point, click, click, goodbye, click, 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 click. All they have to do is click one button, and you're gone. Sayonara, right out of here. So they have to learn. You have to grab attention very quickly. Shock them. To it's everyone just... that's listened so far, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't get to this point, though. Yeah, right? <laughs> Ever, everyone who made it here, you get a gold star. Yeah. <laughs> you have a good attention span, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, I want to get to. Remember, he seems to be hanging in there. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> he's uh, he's got a really good attention span. Yeah, he yes. just sits and listens. He's very patient, unlike <laughs> when he was alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's a little bit more accepting now. <laughs> Yeah, his, um, his ghost is a lot more easier to get along with. Yeah, I'm assuming so. <laughs> <laughs> I still love him, even though. Um, On the cruelty? Next, yeah, the next essay is by far my favorite. This was oh, God, yeah. Essay. There were, the others were okay. I, they were good. They were funny at points, but this is by far. So first I want to say, person. like, uh, on all of these essays, but this one in particular... I felt the translation in our PDF was lacking. Mm. Um, this translation is excellent. Uh, if you have a chance, buy the real book by Penguin. The screen uh, was 
Screech translation, it's much easier to follow. Like in this translation, it, it at some points you're like, what is Montaigne talking about? Yes, um, I know. I was lost sometimes. I, I, I was lost. I, I didn't want to say that. This. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to say that because I felt embarrassed. But please read I, this one. It's okay. really, it's excellent. It's really easy. You know what everything means, and it, like, the, oh wow! I just, I'm, I'm gonna put down the PDF a lot. Like every single one, this beat it by like three or four times. Get this one, uh, and like I think there's some points you're, you're gonna, mi- it would be easy to miss without this translation, um, because like. What's the title of the essay? Uh, it's actually called uh, Essays. Wait, uh, the complete essays is this one, but. Um, okay, got it. Uh, but this one, this is excellent, uh, and it's the non-abridged, right? So it's got all of his essays. The PDF is just the abridged. Um, it's, it's got some the best of, but there are some excellent, excellent, excellent essays that are left out of the PDF. Um, because like in this one, Montaigne is playing a little game in this one, in this on cruelty essay. Um, he, he's, at this point, during while well, writing his essays, he's decided, like, he's going to be even more honest with us. Um, so he he's going to show us when his very idea of what a virtue is changes. And it's in mid-essay. Um, he starts off with one idea of what a virtue is, and he changes it mid-essay. And he's going to show us why he changed it. But it's it's... Especially with this translation, the PDF, you, you, it doesn't come across. Right. It comes across much more in this one. So I think that's one point. It's much better. This so I highly recommend this one because this this one is on on cruelty, but mo- the, a big chunk of the beginning is about virtue. What is virtue? He's trying to hash out what is a virtue. Um. So I want to get into that a little bit because he starts. He so he starts with virtue is the overcoming of vice. Um, this is where he starts. This is not where he's going to end, though. Mm. Um, it's a battle. It, exactly. He starts it as a battle, and he he likes this idea a lot, right? And actually, I do too. But he realizes halfway through that <laughs> uh, this is not going to do it because if virtue is a battle, that means somebody like Socrates couldn't be virtuous because Socrates. Arrived, he built a character. He built his own character to such a point that he no longer had to battle. Vice never even entered into him, right? He had constructed his character to such a point that, like, Vice was unthinkable. There was no battle. He he was like kind of like the perfect virtuous guy, and he didn't want to exclude Socrates from the realm of virtue. So I think he switches it up. He says he kind of makes it a three tiered, two tiered system then. The best is to develop a character in which vice can't take hold. Uh, the second is to fight and overcome vice in you. And after that, the, the least admirable character is someone who just naturally finds vice distasteful. Just out of pure preference. Innocence. I think you almost associate yeah. with kind of innocence. Innocence, yeah. This is the lowest character. It's almost unpraiseworthy at all. And this is actually, he considers himself this, yeah. the lowest category. Um, but this this transition is, is critical here in this essay, I think. Um, I don't know why. This, this this time, like, I was flashing on Nietzsche left and right the entire oh, God. time. Yeah, I, I mean, this is exactly what I wanted to say about this one. This the his idea of the greatest kind of virtue is uh, self-overcoming, a transformation, um, an overcoming yeah. of the human. In other words, yeah. starting with a problem and overcoming the human, making yourself into something new, transforming yeah. yourself into the, the quote-unquote the Superman, the Ubermensch. Right? This is what his idea of virtue is in the beginning. I was really impressed with this. Yeah. I think he... And he doesn't throw that away. I think he just wants that make a character, he wants to add developing a character into that, like a character that, that has overcome yeah. as the top. Because I like how he kind of, he kind of attacks this person who just naturally avoids yeah. vice, like himself, right? Who just, he's just, I don't know, no reason in particular, he just doesn't really want to sleep around and he does, doesn't really find it interesting to lie, but not for any yeah. moral reason. It just, it's, it's, you know, just doesn't interest them. 
Um, right, it says right here in this one, I like it, it's almost, it reminds me of LaRouche Foucault, right, when he says that several virtues can come from bodily defects, right? And he said yeah. chastity, sobriety, temperance, um, they come from an inability to judge events correctly and realize their actual nature. Stupidity can disguise them, right? In other words, it's not that they're virtuous, it's just the people themselves are too stupid to judge the situations correctly <laughs> so mm. that they're not tempted at all, right? It comes from defects in their character. That they yes. act so, I want to. I think, I well, yeah. Uh, this and he almost. I think he's trying to kind of say here that these type of people, these people who just naturally find vice distasteful. Um, sure, they don't do evil, but they can't do good either, uh, or they can't. They can't do anything virtuous either. They're just. Um, uh, they're just in a weird sense. I guess I want to throw. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna tw make make a big Nietzschean twist on this, but they're just weak, uh, in the sense that they would never be able to withstand real temptation because they've never worked on it. All they're doing is is going with what they feel like doing. Um, and this this is just. I mean, okay. I want to throw this out here. I don't know if is that is that weak or is that the child. In Nietzsche's metamorphosis, I mean, not the beginning, but not the creative child, mm. but the child. Like, wait, was that is this what he would call the Greeks then, the playful children that knew of no limits, right? But because of their innocence, right? And then when they were corrupted, they fell and they had to fight their instincts. I, would Nietzsche say that the Greeks in this way were like this? Ooh, wow, uh, that's coming at an angle I didn't expect. Um... <sighs> The Greeks had to overcome the the pain of life, and they weren't, they weren't yeah. pessimists, right? They'd lived a tragic life, but he kind of always liked to compare them kind of with violent children or something, right, that they didn't know. They just acted on instinct, and then they were corrupted later when Socrates came in. Hmm. Um, I kind of, I mean, it almost seems like, because, like, I, I kind of think Nietzsche was, he didn't say it much, but I think you're in love with virtue in this sense, in the sense that's being talked about in this essay. Yeah. Um, in the sense of overcoming, I think Nietzsche thought these people <laughs> overcame. Um, yeah. But what were they overcoming? I guess um, weaknesses in themselves, right? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, if if these people had the ability to overcome, it must have been some kind of weakness in themselves or in others. Yeah. Um, in other words, this must have been a strength. This must have been their strength. Because, I mean, if they were just... Uh, how should I say? If they were so weak as to... How should I say? Like, like well, how about this? Like, how about this? Like, let's imagine somebody who's born with a fast metabolism versus somebody who really has to watch what they eat. Um, like, let's imagine this person with a fast metabolism some, some someday encounters a food like ice cream, infinity ice cream, right? I mean, this person's going to get fat on infinity ice cream um, because they haven't learned to watch what they eat. Or how about this? Like, a kid in high school becomes popular uh, for no good reason, just because they look handsome or cute, uh, versus somebody who really had to work for it. Um, I don't know, like, it seems like uh, at this level, there's, there's really nothing there t to... There's no drive to overcome at all. It's just, it is a kind of weakness, isn't it? Isn't it obliviousness? Why would it be weakness, not just lack of experience? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm sure these people could become stronger. By the way, they could become stronger, but now they're weak because they've never oh, had to overcome. Well, just untested, maybe. Well, untested. I mean, but like. I don't know if that's weak. Oh, I guess. Well, I mean, even. Let's, let's 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 say even even Spartacus was weak before he started working out. I mean, it's it's well. I suppose I, I guess if put to the test, he could show some kind of super ability. Uh, I guess yeah, sure. So maybe they are untested. If you're likening it to a muscle where you think the muscle, the untrained muscle, is weaker than the trained muscle, but I think uh, for example, I mean, I don't know. Just if you're doing things just because you want to. Um, that's going to lose. That's going to lose to things that have reasons. 
Well, I, I don't think, but I haven't read the essay. Mm. I think actually doing something, if, <laughs> um, doing something that you just because you want to is actually intuitively tapping into one of your strengths, maybe. Well, I mean, it could, but for example, okay, if well, it's a, if okay. it's a temptation, though. Yeah. Would, for example, cigarettes would be a good ah. example, right? I mean, I, I think of it as, as a temptation of vice, or it's, I guess when it becomes a vice when it's something you don't want to do. But I mean, but yeah, I mean, but something you don't want. To, but see, isn't this is where the paradox comes in? I mean, it is it, it is something you want to do. Yeah, right? it is. It's something you should not do. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's something you want to do and don't want to do. Uh, but it, you don't want to do it on a higher level than the level you want to do it at, right? Uh, I'm sure smokers face this all the time. Like, they want to smoke, but they don't want to smoke. Uh, I want to eat ice cream, but I don't want to eat ice cream. I mean, um, when, when it comes to this, I'm always reminded of what Bill Maher said about sm quitting smoking. I really liked it. I don't yeah. know why it always stayed with me, but when you quit smoking, you have to quit with a pack in your hand. In other words, mm. simply depriving yourself, in other words, throwing yourself on a desert island, he would rate lower than quitting with a pack in your hand, ready to go yeah. anytime, staring you in the face. Right, and one of those guys has a stronger will, could overcome reality stronger. Right, like when when you know in America now we, for example, we tape we staple our stomachs shut. Right, I mean, I guess in the, in, in terms of virtue, maybe people like this would rank that lower. They'd say, well, the, the truly strong person mm -hmm. would would lose weight with a stake right in front of them. Yeah. Right, the iron will. But it seems like um, to lose weight with a stake in front of you. Or to not smoke a pack of cigarettes, um, you're not going to do that on gut. Yeah. Um, you need you need to have thought it out once. Unless you're in this state of innocence. Unless you're in the state of innocence, and then that that doesn't just. I guess the state of innocence really doesn't mean anything, does it? It's almost kind of like you are untested in that way, right? But I I, I guess you, you don't. You're not ready for that battle. You haven't been trained in in, in, in resisting and the, the Japanese virtue of gaman, right? Mm. You haven't this been trained. So I wanted to bring in this. Uh, yeah, I wanted to bring in gaman here. This is um, this is the training that the Japanese go through. I mean, this is one of their primary virtues, gaman, mm. gaman. This is how you overcome. Yeah. But this is how you become a human being too. I mean, human beings, gaman. That's how you become human. You put off immediate pleasures for later pleasures, right? If you yeah. didn't do that, we'd really be like animals in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we all have to go through a certain kind of overcoming. Although, from in my instance, I have this habit of eating. Like I, this is kind of a theme today is eating. But I have a habit of overeating, and pizza is one of my main vices. And I can't resist a pizza, and I can't mm. resist carbohydrates. A good baked potato or a good pizza will down me at just about any time. And I have mm. a lot of trouble with this, and it's something I'm struggling with even right now. Um, and, and it's hard. Um, and I, the pizza is right in front of me every day. right? And this, the second I lose my willpower, I'm eating a pizza. I'm like, well, screw it. I'll just have something today. And I, I, I find myself quite weak in the face of my pizza. And um, I guess up until this point, though, until I was at least in my 20s, I didn't have to ever worry about it. We didn't have to worry about this. I don't know if we had a fast metabolism or what, mm -hmm. but I never had to worry about my weight until this point. And I saw how weak I truly was when it came to resisting temptation. Yeah. I hadn't I hadn't been used I hadn't lived my life resisting temptation. I just kind of lived eating what I wanted and doing what I wanted. Mm. And it came to a point now, in the, later in my life, I'm not exactly old, but later in my life where my body can't do that anymore. And I was not trained or in any way equipped to handle that. I am, I am, I'm ill-equipped in this battle, and I know it. I feel it every day. Mm. Mm. That's, and, and I think being ill-equipped or just unfamiliar with an issue is different from weakness. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, maybe weakness is a bad word, yeah. yeah because I like uh, if you're comparing, your, if you're looking at it in terms of the competition, then that would be a weaker competitor, one who's less familiar or less trained, mm -hmm. in the, unless they had some sort of natural talent, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
But, um, I mean, if, if I was just going to say, like, let's imagine, like, in a job interview, somebody says, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Mm. Well, like, I have a weakness for chocolate. Me I mean, too. this, I like this. I mean, like this. You know what I mean? Like, I, I do, I have desires that I shouldn't have. Oh, I, th I think I shouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... I By the way, I, I, um, in term, I've been fighting weight issues for a long mm -hmm. time, and I pinpointed recently, in the last year, that I only crave sugar, and I only... Yeah, my normal metabolism, my normal state of being does not crave things unless I'm too tired. Um, oh, that's, that's interesting. interesting. That's interesting. It's, mm. um, it's... If I start to... If I find myself, oh, I want ice cream or I want chocolate, I think, Linda, stop now. You're overworked mm. in your past. Mm. Your body's starting to try to fuel yourself to continue something that actually you physically part, or I don't know, whatever, it's just past doing. And I've learned mm. to stop. Mm -hmm. And um, rest and drink water or something. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. But if I continue past and keep pushing myself, I can't. And mm. after a really stressful day, when I push it too far, I will binge, you know, on junk food. <laughs> mm. uh, but you probably find you don't do that in the morning. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I kind of want to take this into a weird zone. Like, I'm halfway around the topic of eating because I, I remember, like, TJ, um, he's a very, very popular YouTuber. Um, uh, like, he talks about he's overweight and he has a lot of weight issues, and he talks about what it's like to deal with those sometimes. Um, and I kind of want to bring in this, like, I want to say that somebody who's born with a slower metabolism and who has to, who really, really wants to eat cake, uh, but they can't because the metabolism is slower, is a more vir virtuous person than, you know, Miss A, who was just born with a fast metabolism, who's eating cake all day. She's, you know, super slim or he's super slim, right? I want to say the person who has to watch their weight, who has to watch what they eat, is a more virtuous person. Than that the person. That's a good one. But I, I totally see what, what you're saying about being untested, right? Because... I mean, it could be that somehow, you know, you have this super iron will. But in most cases, I would say that you don't, right? And then just like every other thing, your mind requires training and learning to not indulge yourself, for the most part, requires training, right? And then for the, in a general tendency, you're more willing to give in to yourself than not and to do what you want to do than not. So it could be that these untested people are actually quite good at not eating pizza, but in my case, it turned out that I was just human, <laughs> and, and I fell right into the trap of doing what I wanted to do, and I, it's interesting, in your case, you said it was when you were sleepy, or uh, when you were tired, but in my case, it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's bizarre moments of, like, um, when I'm, hey, when I'm, like, I don't know, moments when I feel like I should be doing something, or, or empty moments I'll fill with eating, um, which is very dangerous. I know, I when I say that, I already realize that there's several psychological problems peering out of there when I say that in empty moments I'll eat. Um, I don't understand what you mean. Well, it's it's like I'm trying to fill a gap. Of, I should be doing something else, but I'm filling that gap with eating. Um, That's why which, string cheese is invented. Yeah, exactly. I, this is one of the things I eat, string cheese. And this is, oh, me this, too. <laughs> this, is the, this points to a very, I think almost a worse problem than you have. It's a, it's a psychological problem about guilt and and and, and much deeper problem that we don't need to get into, but I, I feel like I suffer from, actually, very, when, when, when I do things like that, I feel like I suffer from a little bit deeper psychological issues than I, I'd like to admit, <laughs> but it's not, it's not something I like. Yeah, I mean, like, when, when things are really going well, I feel like I can, I can not eat more. When I feel like I'm on top of things, I feel like, uh, no problem, I can skip dinner, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we got a beer. Wish I had a beer there. <laughs> I have sour cherry. You like oh, the poison wine? I, I, so, I'm with, I'm with my, I do have a thing of wine, but uh, I tend to drink when I'm unhappy, so I'm quite happy at the moment. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because wow. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> people drink. I, I'm not a drinker, natural drinker. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was drinking two days ago and sort of really grumpy and watching trash TV. Yeah, that was... <laughs> um, so in my instance, like, I find that exercising actually reduces my chances of eating. Like, I, I just go out and do something. I put my mind off of it. It really helps, like, um, doing something else. Right? When I'm not I mean, doing something. Don't you think, though, exercise also helps in the sense that you feel your pro progress. You feel yeah, like you're you progressing. Progressing towards something. I mean, and then that, that gives you the self-esteem that's necessary to deny that appetite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was it the... Lately in Japan, the, this uh, these food counselors, as they're called, have been um, hayatte Oh, really? Yeah. And what they do is they they essentially counsel you to help you with your eating habits. And these uh, kind of these compulsive eaters, you know, the guy, the housewives who always have that bag of sembe open. Then they said the the most important thing is just to wait five minutes. Ah, uh, interesting. And so just mm. do something for five minutes, and then. And, it's, and that should kill that. And also drinking water. Like sometimes I would eat because I don't have a very strong thirst mechanism. I, mm. I, I rarely I have, unless it's midsummer, I don't really want to drink anything. And I would often eat when I really needed liquid. <laughs> mm. um, but this, uh, I might, if I can find, uh, I've been using this. Um, meditation for weight loss. It's very interesting. As it's interesting to try because trying to influence you on a, on a very different, I don't know, level of operation maybe. But I found it did influence what I wanted to eat. Mm. Without, and there weren't. It wasn't logical thinking, judgment stuff. It was like, oh, I don't. I, I have sort of actually a physical revulsion to things that I would to, to more carbohydrate sort of stuff. And I'm thinking, whoa, it's mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm. Well, meditation is very. I, I can't. You can't deny the benefits of meditation. It's very. Mm. Mm. Yes. I'm, well, I'll, I'll see you in a couple of months and see if I actually. Uh, <laughs> um, Jesse, I've been d doing twice a day this sort of 20 minute meditation on um, energy coming into my body from the world so that I feel protected by and nourished by other things except food. And I don't need the weight. You know, this sort of. It's very interesting and um, trying to liquefy the fat into energy, not, not liquefy, actually change it into the energy that will flow out of the body. It's fascinating. It's I, I find it fascinating to listen to. Oh. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, See, my, my old co-workers for the first time, I'm in months, months just on Monday, it was, I was surprised how many people told me I'd gotten fat. <laughs> so I'm, uh, meditation might be a helpful, helpful thing to try. Oh, we were actually talking about this before you dropped in, so that wasn't it. <laughs> well, I, I, I got what you're trying to say, Linda. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while either. I, <laughs> we, were, we, were just, we were just bad mouthing you, Jesse. Oh, that Jesse, that Jesse. Oh my God. I was wondering where you were. I wasn't sure if you were off sick with a cold or something. Or yeah. he's so fat, it took the camera this long to register him. Oh. 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 <laughs> hey Jesse, join the club. I'm with you. <laughs> Talk about getting fatter. I just had my health check. I actually saw how fat I got today. Really? Yes, I wasn't pretty either. I was. I'm in a state of depression. <laughs> I am too, actually. I've been. They've been photographing me when I've been teaching English classes, and oh, it's it's shocking. When you you must always. I guess I always look at myself from a certain angle in the mirror. <laughs> I can keep myself <laughs> about certain <laughs> profiles. <laughs> like who? Oh. The non-fat angle. <laughs> the non-fat angle. Yeah. Yes. Um, let, let's finish up this essay and then oh, get out of here. Um, uh, the only thing, the last thing I want to say is just that he said that natures that are bloodthirsty towards animals show a native propensity towards cruelty. I thought that was 
again, in 1500, they already knew. Psychopaths yeah. love to torture animals. Yeah. I was like, wow, even back then we knew it. Yeah, that's I love that line too. That's I I don't know. But I, when it comes to cruelty, he does like basically say he's just has a natural propensity against cruelty. Um, yeah. and I do too. Actually, I can't stand the sight of blood. I it does stand, stand the sight of my own blood. Essay though, though, which is because he says he has he seems to have a very strong imagination. Yeah, this must be the reason why he can't stand cruelty, because like he's very empathetic. He's extremely empathetic. Oh yeah, because yeah, when you're when you have a strong imagination, you're watching a movie with some scenes of violence, and it's so easy for you to impose that on yourself. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, if I was going to take it in crazy ways, I mean, like, that's kind of one of the themes of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, actually, is that we are unaware of the cruelty that we inflict on animals. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I thought this was really good. And, yeah, your imagination can do that to you. And I, I can't stand the sight of blood. I had my blood taken today, and I couldn't look. Um, I used to be able to look, but after a bad experience, I, I'm no longer able to even look at my own blood. Um, yeah, I, I really can't stand it. Um, especially violence against animals, I, I have a, a trouble with. Um, it's kind of funny, because I'll watch movies about people getting hacked up, but uh, animals, um, it's quite... I can't, I can't even watch it sometimes. Mm. And fingernails. And fingernails. Ooh. Uh, yeah, you notice I was do when I was doing my explanation, uh, I was doing this. Mm -hmm. I was... Mm. <laughs> No, this must be an in joke that I'm not getting. What's no, no, just, just finger. Like, really? Can you watch like a video, or, or could you even see somebody with a? Could you look at someone with a cracked fingernail? A cracked. Could you watch someone? Could you watch someone peel off their own fingernail? Oh, because because it was black and blue after they slammed it in the door. Oh Ooh. no, 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 no. Oh uh, no, I mean it's just it's unwatchable, isn't it? It's just yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just felt that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting. Yes, no, no, it's not an joke. We just all know that this would freak us out. <laughs> no, it's kind of a human in joke. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a human in joke. Those mushrooms are sitting there, being like, "What? What the hell are they talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> what are these fingernails? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm going to take us offline, and we, I wanted to figure out what we're going to read for next week. Oh. So, all right, take us offline. All right. And I'll do here. We'll just take these last moments to advertise. Advertising. <laughs> Advertising for your favorite girl. Yeah. Um, Is that Taka, what's it, Takahashi? Jigo? Yep. Yeah.